But I'm really encouraged by how this message series has been progressing. A lot of times when we talk about um, New Year's resolutions and we talk about things to come, we try to target certain uh, specific things. But throughout this series, I've been giving you guys ideas. I've been giving you guys thoughts to engage with God and hopefully come to decisions that will um, help you better change your life. And uh, I don't know how you guys have been doing, but I am getting a little bit better at what my resolution was, and that's getting more sleep at night. I have been going to bed a little bit earlier um, and uh, just continuing to pray that God would help me with that. And I hope that you guys are continuing to pray that God would give you the strength to hold on to what he's asked of you. And as I've shared with you guys throughout this entire uh, series, decisions we make today to d- determine the stories we tell, or we, the stories we'll tell tomorrow, we tell tomorrow. Sorry, that's really bad. Um, d- today's decisions determine tomorrow's stories. Our actions right now, our choices right now, we may feel like they are insignificant choices, but they are critical choices. We may feel like those choices don't matter, but they do matter. We may feel like one decision is not a big deal, but it is indeed a big deal. This morning... I want to talk to you about starting. I want to talk to you about starting. Now, here's the real dilemma. For too many people, it's the start that stops them. For too many people, it's the start that stops them. We get so overwhelmed or we get so concerned with what God wants to do, where God wants to take us, what what the next thing is. Like, Like we get so concerned about the end of our beginning that we don't even begin. We're like, afraid that we're never going to get there. We're afraid that we're not going to work hard enough or we're not going to have enough in us that we're not going to have the fortitude to continue to push through to that place that we want to go. And because of that, we stop before we even start. We don't even come off the starting line. We, 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 we hear the gunshot that says go and we just pause. We freeze. We're afraid. And so for too many people, it's the start that stops them. Now, faith is taking the first step even when you don't see the whole staircase. That's Martin Luther King Jr. You will never finish something you don't start. Obviously. I mean, that's a simple thought. You're not going to finish You're not going to come to that thing that you need to come to. You're not going to discover what it is that God wants for you if you don't begin. If you don't begin. And so what is it for you right now? What is the next step that God is asking you to take? Some of us, we don't even know that step. We don't even know what that decision is. We're afraid to make that decision. We're we're afraid to even take the next step forward to maybe read our Bible more or pray with more intensity or pray with more faith or ask God. Like some of us don't even ask God what he wants us to do because we're afraid of what his answer is going to be. Like we're we're like, oh, I don't know if I should talk to God about this because I, uh, I don't know. For some of us, The next step is just to accept Christ. For others, for others, we need to get more involved in the church. We need to get more involved of what God is calling us to right here or right in our community. Like, it's your step. I don't know what your step is, but it's a step that you have to take. It's a choice that you have to make. Maybe some of you are like, okay, I need to go to school again. I need, I need to go back to college and do something. Some of you that are younger in here, you might say, you know what, I need to work harder at getting better grades. Some of us in here may have to make a decision to actually work out or do better in their job. For some of us, it's serving, or as my wife was sharing this morning, for some of us, it's tithing, all right? For some of us, it's starting over. And we're talking about blank pages. Maybe God is telling you right now that it's time to close a chapter and start one. Or maybe it's time for the book in the series to end and it's time for you to start writing the, the, 
the start of another book. In Psalm 128, 1 and 2, in the message, it says this, All you who fear God, that is, that you have a holy awe or a reverence, a respect, you revel, you're overwhelmed by his glory. How blessed you are, how happily you walk on his smooth, straight road. You work hard, and you deserve all you've got coming. Enjoy the blessing. Revel in the goodness. Revel in the goodness. Some of us, we can't shake it. God is speaking something to us. God is saying something. It's time to make that phone call. It's time to write that note or that email or send that private message, whatever it is. It's time to finally make a decision to say publicly, I am a Christian. For some of us, it is, it is, it is that, that decision that you are going to be more compassionate, that you're going to start uprooting that bitterness that has been in your soul for so long and is beginning to erode your peace. Whatever it is, Whatever you have found yourself in, God may be challenging you this morning to start. Now, there's a story in Mark chapter 10. This is a, this is a messy situation. There's a blind God, or a blind guy by the name of Bartimaeus, and this dude has been blind for some time, and he makes a decision that he needs to get to Jesus so that he can be healed. Now, there's nothing easy about this choice. There's nothing easy about what he is about to do. And so in Mark 10, 46 through 52, he definitely is healed because the, the starting there is, is Jesus heals blind Bartimaeus. And so it starts, it, it goes this way. Then they reached Jericho, and as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, all right, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. Obviously, it was a beggar. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. And when Jesus heard him, he stopped and said, tell him to come here. So they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come, he's calling. Bartimaeus threw aside his coat, jumped up, and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus asked. My rabbi, that means teacher. The blind man said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith is has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. I've read about this before. There's something that occurred there called synaptogenesis, and synaptogenesis is when your brain or or the endings right there begin to reconnect, all right, with your eye so that it can create vision again. Can you imagine... Can you imagine being Bartimaeus? It doesn't say when he became blind. Maybe he saw it first and something happened and he became blind. Maybe he's been blind his whole life. But can you imagine for a minute seeing nothing and then seeing something? Like, can you imagine for just a minute the the disorientation of not seeing a single thing and then suddenly you see everything? You can see the people that are surrounding you. You can see Jesus Christ himself. You can suddenly see with clarity what is happening around you. Shocking. It was probably shocking. Now, this is a bold decision, and this may be the start this morning. But this guy made a bold decision to holler Jesus' name. And then shout louder when people told him to shush. (laughs) He decided that he was going to shout Jesus' name. 
He decided that he was going to yell. He decided that on that, that, that he's sitting there, he's blind, so he can't run after him. He's going to bump into all kinds of people, maybe fall on the ground because he can't get to Jesus, so he's sitting there. He hears that Jesus is coming, so he shouts at the top of his lungs. Can, just, just imagine this scenario for a minute. He starts to yell. People turn around and say, quiet. You're disruptive. You're causing an issue. You're, you're, you're causing Jesus to be distracted from what is important to him, what he's doing right now. And Bartimaeus gets more belligerent. Uh, you tell me to shut up, I'm going to shout louder. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shout with more vigor. I'm going to try my hardest at this point to grab his attention because now you're telling me to be quiet. Now, this was a, a silly start. I want to tell you this morning to start small. For him, the starting small was just to yell. Like, that was his initial decision. He wasn't sitting there and he wasn't saying, okay, I'm meditating on God and his word. I hear Jesus, you know, and, and, and I'm just going to believe, you know. He, he didn't have a starting place. He didn't know what the, the first phase was. He didn't know what surrender looked like. He didn't know what it meant to need Jesus Christ. All he knew is that Jesus was around and he was going to yell. He was going to yell. And it was going to be disruptive. It was going to be a problem. People were going to look at him like he was an idiot. Let's be real. People were going to look at him and say, what is your deal, Bartimaeus? Tell this guy to shut his mouth because he's distracting everything that's happening here. And, and, and so he begins to yell. We've got to be willing to start small. Finding itself in the center of the book of Zechariah where God is speaking through prophets and the coming son of Christ, we find this phrase, Zechariah 4.10. And, and just, just to give you a little bit of more information, Zerubbabel led the first group of Jews, numbering 42,360, who returned from Babylon captivity. Okay, in Zechariah 4.10, it says this, Do not despise these small beginnings. Do not despise... Small beginnings. What is your small beginning? Maybe it's reading a verse every single day in the Bible. Maybe your small beginning is deciding that tomorrow you're going to pray more. Maybe a small beginning is not necessarily sending the note, but beginning to write the notes. Maybe your small beginning is to, to ask God, okay, how can I, because I don't have it in me, I don't know how, how can I forgive? How can I release this burden? How can I let go of whatever it is that is causing me trouble? Maybe you've got an addiction of some kind. Maybe you're dealing with something that you just can't get enough of. Insert whatever it is. It could be shopping, it could be drinking, whatever it is. And God is saying to get rid of it. You know what your small beginning might be? Your small beginning might be telling someone about it. Like, I need help. I need help. And I don't know how to get help. I need to do something. I, 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 need, to, I need to get through this. I need to get over this. I need to break through this. What is this small beginning for you? What is God asking you to do? Where is God calling you to go? We don't even start because we're afraid. I'll be the first to admit that. I'll be the first to admit that. I was in high school, and I knew from an early age that God had called me to ministry, and I just, you know, I, I'm going through, you know, my early childhood, and, and things got really, really dysfunctional, and, and I just started saying, you know what, this whole ministry thing, I, mm, I just don't know about it. And, and you know, I, I, I was determined that I was going to go to community college and you know, it wasn't that I wasn't going to do anything important. I was going to go into early childhood development because I was working at a daycare and I was enjoying myself working with three-year-olds. And, and um, <clears throat> I mean, I had some interesting things. The ratios were like 12 to 1. I mean, if they anarchy, I would have been in serious trouble. Um, <clears throat> and, and so, you know, I was just like determined, like, this is what I'm going to do because it's easy. It's convenient. 
and uh, God just kept nudging me. And, you know, some of you guys have heard this story before, but, um, you know, before she was, like, hotness to me, my wife was on that trip as well, and we were in Florida. We all crammed in this van, and we went to Florida to this conference, and there was, like, thousands of teenagers there, and and um, this guy, Steve, Steve Hill, right? Yeah, Steve Hill. He's since passed away, but he's preaching. He's just preaching. And I mean, there's thousands of kids there, so he could have been talking to anyone. And he's preaching. He's going at it. And then suddenly he pauses and gets real quiet. And I'm like, okay. He's like, God's telling me something right now. Um, there's somebody in this audience who's going to community college next year, and you know better. I'm just like... And then, um, and then he went right back into preaching. And I'm just like, yeah, uh, I don't know if I can do this. I don't know if I can handle this pressure. And so my small decision, I went back to the hotel room after the conference, and I asked a friend, I'm like, can you, can you pray for me? Because I, I just, this, it doesn't make sense. I mean, it's already near the end of July. And if I'm going to go to uh, community college, you know, things are already starting, it, you know, for the first semester and I've got to get to it. I don't even know how I'm going to sign up for any kind of ministry school or anything like that. And literally, I got home. <clears throat> we prayed in that hotel room. I got home. I made some small decisions each day. And within two weeks, I was, um, I was already on my way to master's commission, as, as they called it, or call it, in a church in another uh, city, and it was just like, boom, just like that, boom, 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 boom. Small decision after small decision after small decision resulted in me going to ministry school, and now I'm a pastor, and I get terrified every Sunday before I even stand up here. Um, <clears throat> and for me, small decisions resulted in big answers, God leading me to the next thing. Babies make small decisions. Babies make small decisions. Like, you know, they, you may, you know they make small decisions to start crawling or start, you know, army crawling on the floor. And then they make decisions to kind of move up to their knees. And then they make decisions to get up on their feet and act like a drunk Frankenstein to get to the next spot. I don't know if you guys have ever noticed this, but it, I mean, it is hysterical. Each one of my children that have taken their first steps, it is hilarious. Now, it's pretty scary when they lean over and just head dive, you know, and you're trying as a parent not to laugh. You're thinking, okay, they didn't fall that far. It's not going to cause any brain damage. Um, <clears throat> but then, then you realize that they have the natural padding on their rear, so you're hoping that they fall backwards, but then it's an issue if they just, you know, kind of, because then it, never mind. Um, I think you guys know what I'm getting at. Because those, you know, are filled with stuff. And, you know, if they fall at the wrong time, it just can create leaks. And I, I still, <laughs> you remember that guy in, in, in Dayton that he was, he, he was actually a, a soldier who guarded um, terrorists at get, get, <laughs> Guantanamo Bay. He worked with the hardest of heart. And we're sitting there in our living room having a young adults meeting, and, and um, it would be Liberty. Um, Liberty, you know, did what babies do, and it didn't stay in that thing that we call a diaper. And I watched as this soldier began to gag uncontrollably and run out of the room. And I'm like, Jesse, I don't understand this. Like, you are a soldier, and this... <laughs> Small decisions. I don't know how I got there from here, but that's okay. Small decisions. Babies aren't afraid to make those small decisions. Babies are not afraid. They have this resilience. Like, I'm going to get up and I'm going to move on my feet. I'm going to get up and make a deliberate decision because I have got to get to those cookies. All right, they make deliberate choices, even though it looks foolish and silly when they begin to take those first steps. For us, the details may not be recognizable. We may be uncertain. We may be afraid, but we know that God is tugging on our hearts and telling us to do something. It's not necessarily, it's not necessary to have the faith of the finish at the start. 
But if you are going to finish, you must have the faith to begin. You don't have to, oftentimes in my own experience, many times in my own experience, I don't have the faith to finish, but I had to gain the faith to begin. I'm, you know, when, when I started going to ministry school and I was making a decision to go into ministry, I didn't have the faith to finish the schooling. I didn't have the faith to start that first ministry. I didn't have the faith to preach for the first time, but I had the faith to begin. And when you begin in faith, God will give you the faith you need with every step to get you where he wants you to be. So if you fear that you don't have the faith to finish By any means, pull yourself up. Pray with crazy prayers. Ask God to give you the courage that you need, the faith necessary to begin, to take a start, to do something right now. In Luke 16, it says that, 1610, it says this, if you are faithful with little things, you will be faithful with large ones. But if you are dishonest in little things, you won't be honest with greater responsibilities. What are the little things that God wants you to be faithful with? I would contend that there really aren't little things, but it makes sense in Scripture to talk about it like this. What are the, what are the faithfulness that you need to practice in little things? In little things. Don't be afraid to start small. And don't think that starting small is thinking small. And this is an easy thought here. Take the next step. Do something. In Mark 10, 52, all right, so this guy, he, he took, you know, he, he, <clears throat> he started small. He started shouting at the top of his lungs for healing. He just begged Jesus, like, heal me. And in Mark 10, 52, Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. Instantly, the man could see, and he followed Jesus down the road. Notice a phrase there, your faith. Think about that for just a minute. Your faith has healed you. It was his faith. That faith was instigated by shouting initially, That faith was instigated by believing at the beginning stages of just crying out to Jesus for healing. That faith was began when when he shouted even more. Like he could have shouted and they could have said, be quiet, and he could have stopped shouting. But he shouted louder, and then Jesus heard him, and then Jesus said, Bring him to me. Can you imagine the initial steps? This is he threw his coat aside. You know, he threw every, he, he threw his coat aside. He's like, I got this. Now, I'm sure that even though people were helping escort him to where Jesus was, he was probably fumbling and pushing through the crowd, knocking into people because he couldn't see anything. And he came face to face with Jesus. I would imagine because he was blind, he may have even got in, you know, that like, you know, the proximity of, or oh, get out of my face. I don't know if you guys feel like that sometimes, but, you know, can just, just imagine for a second He's up in Jesus' face, and, and, and he's asking for healing. And Jesus knew that already. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. That blind Bartimaeus would not have been healed if he didn't shout the first time, if he didn't shout louder the next time, and he didn't come to Jesus believing that Jesus indeed could do exactly what he wanted to do, what he asked him to do, what he hoped for him to do. This is instantly, instantly, not gradually, not through a process, instantly. Go, your faith has healed you. Boom, he can see. Just like that. Take the next step. Take the next step. If you don't take the next step, you're going to get stuck where you are. You're going to be in a constant rut. The only difference between the grave and a rut is length. If you don't move forward in faith, you will die. Your heart will grow cold and you will feel more distant from God. 
you will feel that you do not have what you have or had to have with him. If you're going, if you're asking God to help you with something, he's asking you, why haven't you done what I've already told you to do? Jesus said, bring him to me. Jesus said, bring him to me. He called the blind man. They looked, after telling him to be quiet, they looked and said, cheer up. Come on, he's, he's calling you. Now, I, I don't know what significance the throwing of the coat means. I mean, the Bible puts it in there, so, you know, whatever emphasis that has, but, you know, he just, like, he tossed the coat, maybe signifying he's leaving what was. You know, he's, he's walking away from all of that, and he's venturing towards Jesus. Before Bartimaeus met Jesus, he was sitting beside the road. It says that instantly the man could see, and what did he do next? He followed Jesus down the road. He followed Jesus down the road. What am I getting at this morning? The initial step of faith should immediately be responded to with following Jesus down the road. Jesus has plans for you. He has incredible purpose. His intent is incredible. The best decision you can make is the decision to surrender to him in faith. And when he does that immediate change in your life, when something big happens, when you start and God does something amazing, it should cause you to begin to follow him because you know that with him in the lead, you're going to go places you never thought you would go. You're going to change situations that you never thought you could change. You are going to do marvelous things. You're going to affect change in people's lives that you never thought you could do. Never. Never. In all of my ministry, in all of my time, never did I think that I would find myself, I'm humbled, never did I think I would find myself working with a group such as Easter Seals. I know that God has planted me in that place for this time to do this work. I have the privilege of encouraging staff. I have the privilege of speaking and communicating with mercy and grace God's love to clients that are hard to love. You will never accomplish what he wants for you if you don't take that initial step after he's done the big work. It'll be the big work and then it'll be over and then you'll be begging him for the next thing. Faith is more than believing. Faith is more than thinking, talking, having convictions about Jesus. Faith is action. It is movement. It is activity. As James 2.14 says, if people say they have faith but do nothing, their faith is worth nothing. Jesus is the source. Just eight things. I'm going to put them right up there on the screen. Eight things. Accept Jesus. That's critical. That's the beginning phase. As I've always said with you guys, every blessing that comes, is it precedes the decision to love Jesus and to follow Jesus and to accept him and allow him to take control. Immerse yourself in the word, the Bible. It is significant. It is living. It is breathing. It will change you. Pray crazy prayers. Let spiritual curiosity instigate pursuit awaken to be, be to being fully loved seize hope take a scary step and repeat whatever the process is that God is telling you to do repeat it over and over and over again there's something about rhythm in our faith there's something about doing the same thing over and over I'm not telling you to get stuck in the repeat but when God tells you to read the Bible every morning read the Bible every morning when he tells you to 
to, to pray crazy prayers. Pray them every single day. When he tells you, to, when, when he tells you that, that you are loved, that you are fully loved, Wake into that every single day. Seize hope every single day. Take scary, scary steps every single day. I'm telling you right now, God wants to do something with the future. He wants to do something with the right now in your life. There is a blank page that starts right now. Right now. And you got to start. St. Francis of Assisi said this, start doing what's necessary, then what's possible. Then suddenly you are doing the impossible. And once you do what you set out to do, you will realize that you're just getting started. Church, dream big. Dream big. You may have to start small, but start. The smallest step in the right direction just may be the biggest step of your whole life. Father, I pray right now that you would inspire, that you would encourage. I pray right now, Jesus, that we would be motivated. Jesus, that we would be changed, that we would step out in faith, that we would have greater confidence. Jesus, that we would trust in you and trust in your work. Jesus, Encourage us, challenge us, motivate us to take that step. And Jesus, some of us in this room, we just need to holler your name for a few. And we feel like the world is quieting us. We need to shout louder. Jesus, if that's us, help us to shout your name. And when you, come, when you tell us to come to you, and as we are changed by your miraculous work, help us to follow you down the road, knowing that you're leading to great things. Ultimately, eternity, glory, the wonder of heaven. Jesus, I ask, I plead with you to motivate us by your Holy Spirit and that we would respond. And may it launch the greatest adventure of life. May our book be worth reading. And may it always lead to you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Start small today, guys. Do something.